a poor connection. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> hmm. Let me walk through the house and find a better place. Tell me if the connection gets better. So we are live now. I think okay. we are live now. Uh, I will, I uh, before we start... Uh, to find a better signal. <laughs> okay, interesting. So take your time. I'll take my time. It's a long way. Okay. Okay, let me see if I get closer to get a better signal. Okay. Usually the signal is better from here. So I've changed my position. Okay, let's try it. Hi, everyone. Okay, so before we start, I would like to make sure that you can see us and hear me clear and well. I need your feedback, please, as usual. Thank you very much. Hello. So, yeah, people are watching. So, do you hear me and see me clear and well? Maybe we have problem. So I need your feedback. I'm okay. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll check. I will make sure that people are watching and they can hear us clear and well. Thank you, Amira, for your feedback. Clear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your feedback. So let's get started. So good good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or maybe good afternoon from Arizona or good uh, morning. So wherever you might be in this world, thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar. It is my Privilege now to extend to you a warm welcome on behalf of the Higher School of Technology, Moulay Ismaili University in Meknes, Morocco. It is a great honor for me again to introduce and welcome the special guests of this startlingly beautiful evening. Stefan Krashin actually doesn't need any introduction. He is well known for his work in the field of education and linguistics. Besides, he is published and widely read author of the current era. He is known for introducing various hypotheses related to second language uh, acquisition, including the acquisition learning hypothesis. Moreover, he is profoundly loved and respected by his readers, especially youth, uh, whom he has influenced the most with his amazing publications and contributions. Today, Professor Stefan Krashin is going to talk about an interesting topic writing and publishing papers. So thank you very much, Professor, uh, for accepting my invitation again for the third time to be here with us to brighten our day. Thank you very much. And I think, uh, okay, I can give you the floor to start your presentations, your presentation. And before that, I think I will share with the audience your handouts. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Professor. Okay, I'm very, very happy to be talking about this topic, writing and publishing papers. It is not an area in which I have done research. This is not my research. It's research of other people. And I love talking about it because it has helped me so much. And I hope it will also help you. We owe a great deal to people who've worked on the composing process and people who've talked about publications, uh, etc. So part one, I'm going to talk about writing, and I've labeled it Secrets of Writing, because not very many people know about it, but soon you will know about it. And I've numbered the secrets. We have nine secrets of writing, and the first secret is, if you want to be a better writer, more writing will not help you. Writing style, vocabulary, sentence structure, all those things, comes from reading not from writing itself. So that's the first secret. 
Writing form, spelling, all this is the result of reading. But writing does other things for us. Secret number two. This is the big one. And I quote Peter Elbow, a researcher from the East Coast of the United States. I met him finally for the first time at a conference, and I was able to shake his hand and thank him for all the wisdom that he has given us and given me. Secret number two, writing helps us solve problems and can make us smarter. Elbow's quote, meaning is not is what meaning is what you end up with, not what you start out with. As you write, you discover new things. Secret number three, the power of revision. Uh, I'll give you my conclusion right away. The secret to good writing. Sit down, write, have writer's blocks, have problems, take a break, come back, rewrite, and repeat that again and again. This is the process. This is what I have learned. The power of revision. Revision is the core of the composing process. I'm going to quote researchers, but I'm also going to quote writers. The first one's a writer, Neil Simon, a North American playwright. He says, mediocre writers write, good writers rewrite. Kurt Vonnegut, fiction writer, brilliant. He says, this is in his book called Palm Sunday, writing allows even a stupid person to seem halfway intelligent. If only that person will write the same thought over and over again, improving it just a little bit each time, like inflating a blimp, a giant balloon, with a bicycle pump. Anybody can do it. All it takes is time. This quote has been so helpful for me. Ernest Hemingway, wonderful quote. Now, I'm going to quote Ernest Hemingway. This is not my, my vocabulary. This is not how I talk. This is what Ernest Hemingway says. The first draft of anything is shit. No question this is true. Don't worry about your first draft. It's not going to be very good. But then you'll revise, you'll revise, you'll change it. You'll get better and better. What about planning? Yeah, we plan. I plan. I write an outline. Uh, I use different forms. The crucial thing is, be willing to change your plans to rewrite. As you write, you will find your mistakes. Here's a wonderful quote from Robert Frost, a famous poet in English language. He says, I have never started a poem whose end I knew. Writing a poem is discovering. Isn't that beautiful? As you write, you come up with new ideas. Uh, secret number four is something I discussed with Noam Chomsky uh, the last time Neville arranged uh, uh, a webinar for me and Noam Chomsky. Can you believe that? The true living master. We discussed mistakes, corrections. My dissertation was based on correcting someone else's mistakes. I didn't realize I was going to do that. I thought I was going to replicate and get more evidence for the work of Eric Lenneberg but I found that Lendeberg had made mistakes, that he was wrong. There's, and, but I still admire Lendeberg. His hypothesis was brilliant. We all profited. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. You go back, you revise, you correct, and you make progress. I think it's the only way. I have learned to welcome revision, to welcome getting things wrong and making mistakes. This is how we get smarter. Now, my son and my daughter-in-law are mathematicians. And when they were in graduate school, the University of Texas, there was a faculty member there, a brilliant mathematician named John Tate, T-A-T-E. -E. He recently passed away in his 90s. And he was one of the most famous mathematicians in the world. He worked in algebra. He worked with number theory. He worked in geometry. And someone once asked him, Professor Tate, what is your, what is your work day like? And he said, well, um, I spend about 50% of my time working hard and not getting anywhere. 10% of the time I'm making progress, that's all. And 40% of the time I'm wondering how I could be so stupid, how I could be so unproductive most of the time. In other words, 
John Tate, a world famous mathematician, says smart people, brilliant people struggle and worry about it. This is normal, but I'm going to cure you of this today and show you that it's normal and not to worry about it, but accept it. Uh, Campbell, in his book, uh, quoted in Simonton's book, Scientific Genius, too many potential creators are inhibited by a belief that gifted others solve problems directly. We think that smart people, for smart people, the answers come easily. You just sit down and all these brilliant ideas just flow. No, it's revision, revision, and struggle all the time. I learned this when I was in high school, when I was in secondary school. I remember every Monday we had to hand in our compositions that we had worked on through the week. And I had spent hours on my essay making corrections, this, that. My bedroom was a mess, paper all over the floor. And I thought I had done a really poor job. I looked at the student next to me. He looked like he had had a good night's sleep. He was in a good mood. And I, I could peek and look at his paper. And it was in large print, so I could read it. And it was beautiful. It looked so effortless, so gorgeous, so beautiful, so brilliant. I thought he just sat down and the ideas just came to him and he wrote them down. I talked to him. He said, no, that's not the way it is. I did correction after correction. I tried this essay several times in other classes. It didn't work. That was the process for him. That was the process for everybody. Now I'm going to talk about my moment of fame. Um, one of my colleagues in language arts is Susan Ohanian. I depend on her a lot. We talk a lot on email over the years. Her husband is a physicist, Hans Ohanian, a brilliant man. He wrote a biography of Einstein. And Susan and Hans sent me a pre-publication version because they knew I was interested in Einstein. The book is called Einstein's Mistakes, The Human Failings of Genius. I wrote Hans Ohanian a note. I said, you made a mistake <laughs> yourself. The title of the book, the title is not just Einstein's mistakes. It reveals how Einstein had problems, corrected, went back, did it again. Uh, he has a chapter in it about how Einstein wrote a paper, sent it to a journal. He solved a problem in physics, so he thought. The next year, he sent another paper on the same topic. And he said, last year's paper was wrong. And here's the correct version. One year later, he wrote another paper and said last year's paper was wrong and made corrections. And he did it another time, four years in a row. He corrected his own work. My comment was, this reveals, Kepler said this, the wondrous and twisted roads that lead to knowledge. Well, Hans Ohanian was so happy with this, he put it on the back cover of the book, you know, on the, on the uh, protecting paper. And if you go to the bookstore and you buy a hardcover version of Einstein's Mistakes, you'll find my quote. So this is how I got famous. I had a colleague at the university uh, in linguistics department. Whenever he wrote a paper, in those days, we made mimeograph copies and passed them out. His paper always had a message on the top. This does not represent my current position. Whatever I wrote here, it's going to change. This is how we get smart. This is normal. Okay, secret number five. We owe this to Hemingway. Rereading. He says, I arrive, at, I arise at first light, and I start by rereading and editing everything I have written to the point I left off. And you find that you have new ideas the next morning. We're going to come to this again and again. It's called incubation. Secret number six. All the people who give us advice about writing say the same thing, and they're all correct. Delay editing. Now, editing and revising are different. Editing is making this is correcting your spelling, correcting your punctuation. Revising is changing your ideas, finding your mistakes in thinking, and moving forward. Don't worry about editing. Wait till you've come to what you are. You think you're in your final draft. This is the one you're going to send to the journal. Then you edit. 
then correct spelling. The analogy is when you're about to take your shower, don't put on makeup first. Take your shower, then put on your makeup. Same idea, because you're going to change it. If you worry about editing all the way through, it will interfere with your ideas. Secret seven, this is the big one, folks. This has helped me a huge amount. Encourage incubation. Graham Wallace, 1926, a wonderful book called The Art of Thought. If you want to solve problems, what you do is you struggle with the problems. Then you need an interval free from conscious thought and allow your subconscious mind to work on the problem. Toll said this too. All true artists, whether they knew it or not, create from a place of no mind, from inner stillness. Breakthroughs come from a time of mental quietude. I learned a lot from this next person, Poincaré. Poincaré was a mathematician. He worked in algebraic geometry, non-Euclidean geometry, and his work was very important to Einstein in the theory of relativity. Every book I have that is a collection of articles on creativity has a paper by Poincaré. It's the same paper. Here's what Poincaré talks about when he does his math. This has helped me enormously. He's working on his mathematics. Now, this is one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. He runs into a problem. He runs into problems all the time. What does he do? He gets up from the table and does something mindless. He puts, this is 100 years ago, he puts some wood on the fire and then goes back. He takes a short break where he does something that does not require thinking. This is a great secret, my friends. This works for me. Try it. I hope it will work for you. For example, here's what I used to do when I used to travel. Don't do that anymore. And I used to stay in hotels all the time. Here is my secret life in hotel rooms. Now I'll tell you everything I do in hotel rooms. The first thing I do when I get into the room, I take out my computer, open it up, put it on the desk, and start to work immediately. Now, after three minutes of working, I'm working on a manuscript, I'm writing a letter to the editor, something, I run into a problem. I have a writer's block. I have writer's blocks all day long. My life is one writer's block after another. Here's what I do. I take my suitcase, I put it on the bed, open it up, I take out one shirt and hang it up. Then I go back to the computer. That's just like Poincaré putting wood on the fire. Okay. Then I work for a while and I see when I come back, it, it's, it's a little better. The jam up has eased up a little bit. It's a little bit clearer. Well, I work for a while and I get another writer's block. I go to the suitcase. This time I might put away two shirts, maybe three, and put away some of my underwear. Who knows? I go back to my work and it's a little bit clearer. My subconscious mind has worked on the problem. This is called incubation. Very important. This is one of the main secrets I'm telling you. Uh, like Toll says, you're creating from a place of no mind. That means incubation is taking place. Well, writing, if, what you shouldn't do. Here's Stephen King. Let me go to his quote. This is a big one. Stephen King is one of the geniuses of creative writing. He writes more than any other person in fiction, and it's always good. He says, don't wait for the muse. Don't wait for the creative spirit. Your job is to make sure the muse knows where you're going to be every day from nine o'clock till noon or seven o'clock till three. When I start to write something, I don't go for a walk and wait for an idea. That doesn't work. 
I sit down and start to write and wait for the writer's blocks. Here's Madeline Lango, a wonderful author of children's books, young people's books. Inspiration comes during work, not before it. Here's Wallace Stevens, a poet. He says he writes poetry best when he's, when he's walking, that can work, but he carries slips of paper in his pocket and puts down ideas and notes as they occur to him. The incubation process happens. You write down the new ideas. You'll forget them if you don't. And then eventually go back to work. Secret number nine, another big one. We owe this to Irving Wallace, by the way. Irving Wallace is a fiction writer, a fiction writer and a biographer, not a researcher. But he did a paper with a psychologist on writing. He interviewed many writers to see what their habits were. They all keep regular daily hours. They go to work. They do it at different times. Michael Chabon, a novelist, 10 in the morning till 4 a.m. all night. Wow. Uh, Maya Angelo. Maya Angelo rented a hotel room near where she lived and would go there in the morning from 6.30 till around noon. Okay. Regular hours. Isn't this wonderful? Some writers made sure they worked for a certain amount of time. Uh, some of them worked 40 minutes a day, two hours a day, three hours a day. Some of them did a certain number of pages. Uh, some of them did a certain number of words. Uh, for Stephen King, 10 pages a day or 2,000 words. Okay, uh, I will tell you what I do, but don't do what I do. Do find your own rhythm. Okay, I find for me, what works is 600 words when I'm working on a big project, which is nearly always. 600 words. If I do 590, I feel incomplete. If I do 610, I feel stale, like it's not coming anymore. So for me, that works. Find your own number of pages, amount of work, etc. Here's very interesting work by Robert Boyce. Very interesting guy. I'd like to meet him sometime. Robert Boyce uh, was or is a professor at the State University of New York, and he worked as a professor of counseling, and he counseled beginning professors in their work. Isn't that interesting? Uh, beginning professors at major universities uh, ha have a very tough road. Uh, after they do their work, and then after five or six years, they're evaluated whether they keep their jobs or not, whether they get tenure, which is lifetime employment, unless you do something terrible. Uh, and they're evaluated on three things, on their service committee work, on their teaching, and on their writing. But mostly they're evaluated on writing. Uh, teaching only counts if it's terrible. If your teaching's bad, you might get in trouble, but really they don't evaluate make a difference between good teaching and wonderful teaching. And service, you have to do enough, not too much, not too little. Uh, but writing is the main thing. Have you written published journal papers? E and you hand in your portfolio of what you've written in professional journals. And you're either up or out. You get a lifetime employment or you're fired. And it's very hard to get another position after that. And it's very stressful. Well, he interviewed these people to see how they worked, and they divided into two groups very neatly. There were no exceptions. One group were what he called binge writers. Binge is an expression we get from dieting. Uh, you go on a diet, you decide not to eat junk anymore, not to eat sugar and eat only good things, but you do it on a binge basis, like every Saturday you go eat ice cream. And you can have three or four scoops of vanilla ice cream and you give yourself that reward. That's binging. Binge writers do the same thing. They say, I can only write when I have five hours of uninterrupted time and everything is perfect. Everything is quiet. No traffic. No airplanes overhead. You have to call the airport, tell them not to have airplanes over my house. And you work steadily with no interruptions for five hours. That group, none of them got tenure. None of them did the right number of 
of publications. And if they did some, they were of low quality. The other group were what he called daily regular writers. They set aside a certain amount of time or they had a quota. It could be 40 minutes a day. It could be two hours a day. It could be 10 pages. It could be two pages. All of them succeeded. All of them got tenure. The problem with the binge writers, first of all, the five hours of uninterrupted time never happened. It's very, very rare. It's very hard to happen in anybody's life. Also, when they sat down to do their work, they had lost their place. They didn't know where they were. And it took them a long time to find out what they were doing. It's like having a big ball of string and you can't find the end. Uh, Charles Dickens talked about this. He was, he was interviewed when he missed a day of writing. He needed a week of hard slog, hard work to get back into the flow. It takes time to find your place again. If you do it every day, you're always incubating. Always. Your subconscious is working on it. Here's what I found. If I write every day, which I do, I find that the world conspires to help me with my writing. I'll be shopping at the supermarket, okay? And I'll overhear somebody say something. And that will help me in some problem my subconscious is working on. The world will help you solve your problem. It will always be in your subconscious, but not too far away from your conscious mind. So the answer is daily regular writing. On the bottom of the handout, I've given you the big secret. What I think the composing process is, what works for me? Write. Even though you think you have nothing, write. Expect writer's block. Take a short break. Incubate. Rewrite. Repeat again and again and again. This works for my daily life, too. Um, I live in Southern California. And as you know, Southern California is very famous for show business. If you go into a restaurant, the waiter is usually an actor or he's writing a, a screenplay or something like that. And that's true of me, too. I have a show business career. I'll tell you about it because this works for show for writing, creative writing as well. Um, I'm a member of a local synagogue which is quite liberal. Uh, we have a good time at the synagogue. We like it. And every year we put on a play. And I'm responsible for putting on the play. It's from the book of Esther. Christians call it the Old Testament. We call it the Bible. And the book of Esther is a very interesting story. And my job is to do a humorous play based on the book of Esther. And I usually base it on some kind of movie or story, et cetera, and convert it. Well, uh, the cast of the play is always the same. It's the member of the members of the choir. And I like singing in the choir. Uh, especially I like it when it's the Jewish holiday, when it's the New Year's, Rosh Hashanah, uh, the head of the year, or um, uh, when it's Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And I meet the members of the choir, and I've been with them for over 10 years. I know them very well. We're always very friendly. And I like being in the choir because... It puts you in the mood for the holidays uh, very well. You're ready for the holidays. You pay attention, um, et cetera. And, that, and the members of the choir are the cast of the play. And they always say, well, Steve, what's the play going to be about this year? I say, well, I haven't really thought about it yet. <laughs> Give me some time. And I worry. I don't have any ideas. Then I remember Ernest Hemingway. The first draft is not going to be any good. So I write the first draft. I set aside five minutes. The next day, 10 minutes. The next day, 30 minutes. After two weeks, I have a draft. And then it really starts happening. I meet with the cantor, who is the musical director. He's very, very good at this. We usually meet at some uh, cheap restaurant like Denny's in Santa Monica. And we sit at the table and we go over my draft and he changes things because he has more experience with this and he's usually right. But after that, it's nearly done. And it's the draft, draft after draft where it gets. And the big breakthrough is listening to Ernest Hemingway, realizing the first draft isn't going to be any good. And then the process starts. It's the same process in all writing. Well, that's, those are the secrets in writing. Try them out. I hope they work for you. 
as well as they work for me. Part two, the secrets of publishing papers. And I have to tell you, I'm really an expert on this. Uh, I have published more papers than anybody, I'm sure. I think I'm up to over 500. Uh, that's really about 10 a year because I've been doing this for a long time. And I write lots of short papers. And I'll give you the secrets of that and why that's a good idea. Secret number one of publishing papers. This comes again from Peter Elbow, whom I admire so much. Write before you read. The first thing we usually do is you say, well, I'm going to write a paper about spelling. You go to the library, you look up articles on spelling, you read about them. No, don't do that. First, write your first ideas before you start doing research. Write your own ideas. Then when you read, you'll know what you're looking for. Uh, you'll find out what others think, whether they're as clever as you are, <laughs> whether they've come up with the same ideas or not. It's much more interesting. And it's easier to write now when you know less. Secret to this one is giant. Read narrowly. If you're doing a paper on spelling, read only about spelling. When you get a new journal, don't read the articles first. Don't worry about it. Read the papers on spelling first. Stay narrow. Well, I do that, but I make an exception. I look to see if other people have quoted me, uh, no matter what the topic. But then once I recover from that, I start looking at, at uh, I start looking at spelling papers. Don't try to keep up. You'll never be able to do it. You'll always be distracted. Okay, when you start to write, after you've done your study, and you've done, let's say it's an experimental study. Let's say you're doing a paper, I'm making this up, on the influence of caffeine on spelling. And you have two groups writing. One group has three cups of coffee, which I think is a very good idea. The other group has no coffee and writes a paper. Which group is going to make more spelling mistakes? And you see how many spelling mistakes. You get the average and you do a test, like a t-test comparing the groups and you get your data. When you start writing it up, I write, I begin by focusing on the central table. Then I read an article, I look for the big table. There's always one table that has most of the important data that will tell you how the research came out. Group number one, group number two, how many subjects, what their mean was, what their standard deviation was, what the statistical test. In non-empirical uh, papers, there's one or two major statements of the hypothesis. L write that part first. That's a big secret. Don't begin with the introduction. Write the central table first, then the supporting tables that tell you who the subjects were, how many, uh, how old they were, etc. When you've done the tables, then write up the results. That's where you frame the tables and explain them. That's usually the third part of a paper. Then go back, write up the procedure. How many subjects, where you found them, how old they were, um, etc. Then the conclusion. Conclusions are always much too long. Conclusions always begin with a short summary of the results. That's a good idea. Then the apologies. You explain to the reader what you did wrong. Okay, then the implications in future research. Here's my advice. All of these should be short. Don't tell other people what to do. Don't give them lots and lots of advice on what to do next. You are not their professor. You are another fellow researcher giving your results. Assume that they are experienced researchers. Okay, keep it short. Um, one of my favorite papers was by Crick and Watson. This was published in the journal Nature. And it's about the double helix. Remember that? that those symbols about DNA and RNA, the kind of wavy lines. They're the ones who discovered that. <clears throat> They're the ones who discovered that. And they wrote a very short paper about it. If you remember your secondary school biology, excuse me again, <clears throat> you'll be able to understand most of their paper very easily. Here's their entire uh, implication section. Excuse me while I clear my throat. 
he said, it has not escaped our notice that the specific parry mechanism we've postulated suggests a possible copying mechanism. That's all they said. If you know the field, you'll understand that. If you don't know the field, you understand their paper anyway, and you probably shouldn't be reading it. You should be reading something more basic. <clears throat> when I read papers, I don't want other researchers to tell me what to do with the next five years of my life, okay? And I won't tell other people. The next part of writing is the introduction. You are not writing your dissertation. You're writing a research paper, okay? Do this last. Only the necessary background to understand the paper, okay? Make the whole paper short. I'll come back to that later. Only present what is necessary to inform the knowledgeable reader who's a, co a fellow researcher already. Okay, which journal should you publish it in? You're told all the time before you write your paper, have an audience in mind. <clears throat> I disagree. Forget the audience. Write the paper first. Don't worry about the audience because you're going to change the paper many, many times. That's the composing process. Don't worry about the journal. When you have a paper you like, then read it. The paper will tell you where it should go. Delay consideration of the audience until you are nearly done. Don't worry about which journal, all right? Number five, expect rejection. Everybody gets rejected. Nobody talks about it. Most of my papers are rejected because that's the way it is for everybody, okay? The American Psychological Association announced three quarters of the papers uh, submitted to journals are rejected. How about that? That's normal. Important papers will eventually be published. So here's what you do when you get rejection. I'm jumping to uh, secret number eight, but I'm going to do it anyway. When you get uh, comments from journals and the editors have given you uh, comments, don't waste any time. Read them through. If they agree with you, great. If they don't agree with you, deal with their comments immediately. If you agree and you can make changes, fine. If you disagree, forget it. Publish the, try to publish the paper somewhere else. Don't make changes because the editors want you to. It's your paper, not theirs. If you make a change because an editor wanted you to, you will be blamed if it's wrong. So it's your paper. You can never say, I made that change because a reviewer told me to. That doesn't work. It's your paper. You will be responsible for it. Okay. Good papers eventually get published. Do it somewhere else. And this has happened to me over and over again. Okay. Uh, by the way, I write lots of letters to the editor, uh, to newspapers all over the world. I've probably written, oh, at least I've been at this 50 years. So I've probably written over 500 letters to the editor. I would say uh, the, the average for all letters to the editor, uh, about 10%, uh, I'm sorry, about 5% are published. That's all. New York Times, 1% because they get a lot of them. I do about 10%. I'm, I've doubled the average, but still nine out of 10 are rejected. So you can't take this too seriously, okay, when you get rejected, because you're not the only one, all right? Okay, so eventually they're going to be published if you find the right journal. Secret number six, live in the past. There's several kinds of research. The kind of research we are taught to do is called primary research. And I've done a lot of it. That's where you do a study and you write up the results. It's primary. No one's done the study before. Or you write an original idea, an interpretation. You do a different kind of synthesis. That's fine, too. That's not the only kind. There's several other kinds of research 
and they are just as important, in fact, maybe more important. One kind is called secondary analysis. Secondary analysis is to take somebody else's data already published and reanalyze it. I have done this several times. It has been very rewarding. Uh, in the old days, before libraries were all digital, uh, I used to take my study breaks at the Education Library at the University of Southern California. I used to do my work there. And when I wanted to take a break uh, to incubate, I would just walk through the journals, take one off the shelf, et cetera. My favorite section was articles published in 1890 and 1910 on English language arts. And just looking at them, I found some interesting papers. I found two papers looking at spelling of all things, data gathered in 1890 and in 1902, raw data. Now in those days, they didn't have the statistical tests that we have today. Those were developed originally in the 1920s, and this was 20 years before. So what I did, I did this with a student, Howard White. We had a great time. We took the old data and we applied statistical tests to it. We found that the authors were correct. We published the data. Of course, we gave the authors more than full credit. We included their names in the title, a reanalysis of so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, 1897, 1910, et cetera, Kornman and Rice, uh, both of them. And you can find it here. Uh, and we sent them to, I first sent it to uh, a journal on reading. We claimed at the end they were right. Spelling comes from reading. And we sent it to the number one journal in reading, the Reading Research Quarterly. It was rejected the same day it was, it was they, got, they got it, they sent it back immediately. Three reviewers, I think they were working together, and they all say, this is not for us. This is a reading journal, not a spelling journal. And they rejected it. Well, there are no spelling journals, okay? And we had no choice. Uh, and we said that spelling comes from reading, but I didn't argue with them. We immediately sent it to another journal they accepted it within two weeks and we had our publication and it worked. So this is called secondary analysis. You honor the work of the past by doing secondary analyses, by looking at that data and making some use of it. There's another, uh, another way of honoring the past and that's to do what's called meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is when you look at all studies of a certain way. We did this with bilingual education. Several people did this. And we made each study one statistical number. And you can do that. You take, say, the difference between the two groups, and you can get what's called the effect size, which group was better by how much. And you can do statistical analysis on this. This is very powerful. Okay. So I recommend this as well. This is honoring our lineage, honoring people who worked in the past. Okay, secret number seven. Wow. Unobtrusive measures. Unobtrusive measures are wonderful. I love this part. Unobtrusive measures, you don't bother anybody and you don't need to get a grant. You don't need to ask for money. It's right there. Uh, there's a book called Unobtrusive Measures in the Behavioral Sciences. Try to find it. It's wonderful. And they give several examples. Example I like best was an automobile dealer in the city of Chicago. His company was called Z Frank. His name was Zachary. And he had a motto on the radio called Z Frank for your Chevrolet, Z Frank, etc. He wanted to know where he should advertise to radio stations that drivers of Chevrolet would listen to. If they wanted a new car, they would listen to this. He had a dealership, he sold Chevrolets, and he also had an auto repair shop. Here's what he did. He asked the repair people to look at the radios before they fix the cars and see where the radio dial was set. Brilliant. That's a quick way of finding out what radio stations to advertise on. That's called an unobtrusive measure. Um, I co-authored an unobtrusive measure. Uh, I didn't invent the study and I didn't do most of the work. My colleague, <clears throat> Nishan Ashtari did it. I think it's a brilliant study. Her uh, interest was 
what's called heritage language development. Heritage language is a language children have at home that they grow up with, and you generally don't keep it. You use your heritage language with mommy and daddy and maybe grandpa and grandma, but once you go to school in the United States, English takes over. And she looked at the survival of the Farsi language, the language spoken in Iran, in Persia. And she went to libraries in the neighborhoods where there are lots of immigrants from Persia, from Iran, and found all the books she could find that had anything to do with Farsi language. She took them down from the shelf and did what's called a wear and tear study, an idea she got from our colleague, Jeff, Jeff McQuillan, who did the same thing, and looked to see how many pages people read in the book, uh, grammar book, self-help book, teach yourself Farsi. For example, where were the markers? Where were the pages creased? Where were those little dirty marks from fingerprints? And she found from that, she looked at all the books she could find. The average number of books, they looked at a few pages, at the most 10, and then put them back. That's called an unobtrusive measure. She didn't have to do anything. She didn't have to interview people. She didn't have to bother anyone. It was a couple of hours in the library and you got the results. And there's the connection. You can find it uh, yourself. Okay, secret number nine. I'm skipping eight because we already did this one. Secret number nine, resist acting on infatuation. This is my problem. And this is the problem of every active researcher. We fall in love with new ideas and we get totally interested and we can't wait to work on them. This happens to me four times a day. Uh, here's what it says. Simonson, a philosopher of uh, creativity, says uh, the more successful psychologist is one whose research program concentrates on a well-defined set of interrelated topics rather than spreading out too thin. Resist infatuation with ideas outside your main interest. This is very hard to do. When I get a new idea, I can't wait to find out more about it. Eventually, I'll write it down and set it aside and go back to it sometime. But work on what you're working on now. You want, as, we, as Walter Cannon says, a natural development from one group of ideas to another instead of flitting from interest to interest in a quite inconsequential manner. I want to ask, this is basically my message today, but I'd like, instead of going to your questions, to ask and answer the first question, which I think is on your mind right now. We've been doing research on this for 45 years. The idea of comprehensible input and the limitations of grammar, all the things I've been working on, we've known for quite a while and I'm not the only one. This wasn't my idea. Other people have worked on it too. Why aren't we doing it? Why are most foreign language programs still traditional? Why are they grammar-based? Why don't we work more on reading for pleasure, et cetera? What, why is this taken so long? Uh, well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> this is what I think the answer is. And this, for me, is a declaration of war. First of all, scientific knowledge things I've told you about, they're hard to find and they're expensive. They're buried, first of all, in professional journals, okay, that are you have to subscribe to or you have to have access to a first-class research library and have privileges to use it. You must be a faculty member at that time there. It's hard to find. So, and then once you find it, it's expensive. These books, I can't afford them. I can't afford the new books. I can't afford the journals. If you see an article in a journal that you want, you find out how you can order it, you have to pay 40 American dollars and the journal gets it, not the person who did the article. So it's very, very expensive. The books are expensive. Few people can afford them. Uh, number two, the papers and the books are long, much too long. I don't have time to read all the new papers because they are much, much too long 
no one can read all this stuff. A quote from a scientist 300 years ago, when we ask the time, we don't want to know how watches are constructed. That's the way papers are done now. People publish their dissertations. Number three, articles are hard to read because they're full of what we can only call gibberish. Uh, Chris Hedges, political writer, says, as long as academics write in the tortured vocabulary of specialization, where they're unable to influence public debate, they're free to espouse any bizarre radical theory. They make it hard to understand so they won't be criticized. So no one understands what they're doing. Here's what I have been doing and here's what my colleagues have been doing. And I really recommend this. Otherwise, the field is over. It's dead. We'll never go forward. My colleagues and I, first of all, are publishing what we call open access. There are journals that will publish your paper. It's free to subscribe. You get it right off the internet. They don't charge the reader and they don't charge the author. Everything is free of charge. Um, I publish all my articles now open access. So does Nishan Ashtari, so does Jeff McQuillan, so does Lucy Tse, so do all my colleagues right now. This is how we're doing it. Uh, this is how we can get our work along. For Jeff McQuillan, his work is so good. He uh, publishes under the, if you look under Backseat Linguist, you'll find his brilliant, short, clear papers, and you will be up to date on all the research, okay? So this is what we're doing now. I don't write books anymore because nobody can afford them. Uh, for me, all my articles are now available, at least many of them, for free access and free download on my website, sdcrashen.com. You may download them. You can share them. And many of the things I've talked about today is in an article which I've put on the, uh, on the handout, on the uh, outline, and you can find all the stuff there. Okay, and well, I'm ready now for any other questions that people might have or that you might have. Yeah, thank you. Hello, can you hear yep. me? Yes, I hear yeah. you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Stephen Krashen, for giving such informative and interesting presentation. We learned a lot from you. Uh, I have some questions here. Uh, I've taken the most cited ones. Uh, uh, what makes a good academic research? Uh, so a person asks a question and he says, what makes a good academic research? He uh, means, what makes an academic research stand out comparing to other papers? Okay, let me, let me give you my opinion on this. That's all I have. Two factors. Number one, it helps theory. It pushes our understanding. Number two, it reduces suffering. It helps other people. It doesn't show how smart you are. It helps other people and it creates knowledge, replicates old knowledge or helps create new knowledge. And I'll add a third thing. It's easy to read. Keep it short, please. Great question. Thank you. Interesting. Another question. What are the academic standards that make one's paper unique and interesting? So how can we choose a good journal for publication uh, for yeah, our papers? Well, this, this, this is an easy way to do this. Get on the internet and look at journals. If you look at my work, you can see where I've published. Uh, Jeff McQuillan, look at his stuff. He knows exactly where to publish things. He's very good at it. And they're all open access. Read some of the papers. And you'll get a feel for what the editors are looking for. Uh, most of the journals I publish in are European journals, British journals. They're from India. They're from Africa. They're from all over. I hope I have found the journals that look for clearly written short papers. That's what we want. Interesting. Thank you very much. So here's another question uh, uh, related to plagiarism. Uh, I would like to ask him about plagiarism. How can, we, can I prepare an effective research? 
So when I search on a particular topic, I find several similar studies. So how could my paper be different from others? So we have same ideas. You want to work on the same topic. So how can you make your topic interesting and unique? Well, let, let me make life a little bit easier. Replication is a good idea. If you replicate someone else's work and you say so, that's great. Make a one-page paper. We've replicated so-and-so study. Let me show you how replication works. Uh, some of you, if you remember your statistics class, you remember what p-value is, the chances that something has uh, is really true. So if you find p is less than 0.05, the chances are uh, 19 out of 20 is real. Okay. If you replicate it and get the exact same results, you multiply the p-values. Instead of 0.05, it's 0.025. This is wonderful. Replication is fabulous. I would do replications. If you're a beginning researcher, replicate someone else's work and say so. A replication of so-and-so's work, 1912, whatever. Publish it. Make it short. Then the journal will not have an excuse to turn it down. Okay. If it's important, it deserves replication. Uh, we got a lot of, uh, when I first started working in this area back in the 70s, we found that uh, in English, things were acquired in a predictable, natural order. We replicated and replicated. Each replication, we made a little bit difference. But just the idea of replication was important. The work on bilingual education has been replicated. The work on reading has been replicated and replicated. Each time that happens, we feel better and better about it. So don't avoid copying someone else's work. It's a virtue as long as you tell people that's what you're doing. Interesting. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, maybe here another question about the right methodology to follow for writing articles and the possibility to accept uh, them for publication in an international level or let's say professional journals. Well, keep it short. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if they want it longer, it's the wrong journal. Look at other papers in the journal. Again, you can look and see what where Jeff McQuillan has published. He's a very good guide. He he was my student once. And there's this line from Star Trek, you know, uh, I was the student and you were the master with Jeff. He is now the master. <laughs> I'm the student. He's done so well. So I look at what he's done and where he has published. Look under uh, Backseat Linguist and you'll get some good examples. He really knows what he's doing. And you'll find very concise, clear papers. Find those. You'll get a good model. Look at where I've published, where other people have published. Interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, I have actually a problem with uh, connection. That's why I cannot reach uh, your questions. So uh, I have another question. I hope I have a problem with my laptop. The Wi-Fi is, it doesn't work. Anyway, so another uh, question. Um, so someone wants to know about the strategy that you, Mr. Krashen, follow to organize your writings. Well, yeah, I, I only work on something if it burns inside me. If it's so important, I, I can't stop thinking about it. Those are the ones you want to do. Where it's <laughs> helpful to the theory and it's helpful for teachers and students. We want to make life easier for people. We want to make this more efficient, more pleasant. And I, again, I follow the advice. I work on the essential part first. I don't worry about the introduction. I don't worry about the conclusion, um, et cetera. And I've learned, for example, as I went through this um, outline today with you, I realized the importance of incubation. That's a fabulous thing. If I were working on research now, I'd probably ask people about the incubation process. I would uh, ask them how, how they go about, where they get their ideas, et cetera. And I would only work on that for a while and make it short. Work on what, what, what is burning inside of you and make it as short as you can. And once you got the idea, write it down and then see what other people have said. Interesting. Um, so here's another question. Uh, the, they ask for how to write strong proposal, how to, to write a strong proposal for research. 
Okay, I don't. I have never written a proposal. It's time for me to give you a true confession. Okay, I have never written a grant proposal. I have never asked anybody for money. Uh, I do the work that's easy and cheap to do, that cost nothing. I do that first. I don't know how to write a grant proposal. So my advice is, for me, speaking for myself, I don't even do it. I do the study and I try to find studies that are cheap, that are easy, unobtrusive, where the data is already there and I don't have to bother anybody. This is a different way of working. Now I'll tell you, universities want you to write grant proposals because if you write a grant proposal and you ask for $100,000, the university gets 20% of it. And the dean can spend it on anything he or she likes. But that's their problem. If I don't have to, I'm not going to do it. I think grant proposals should go in areas of chemistry, medicine, physics, where they really need it. Uh, in my area, I don't need special funds to do the research. So I've never written a proposal. I can't give you advice. Thank you very much. Uh, another question uh, someone is asking about the most used or interesting or hot topic uh, for research in English language teaching. Well, Nowadays. yeah, that comes from you. We're all different. Have you noticed that? We are yeah. all different. We all have different interests and different passions, different things we can't wait to study. And that's good. If we were all the same, the human race would never make any progress. So the question is, what is burning inside you? Here's what's going to happen. You find your interest. And when you find your interest, you find other people who have similar interests. And you find that you become friends and you can't wait to help each other. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, uh, in one of his books, Cat's Cradle, it's a brilliant piece of fiction. He coins a term, he invents a term called Karas, K-A-R-A-S-S. -S. He says a Karas is a group of people that have the same interests and the same goals. And they're like a team organized to do God's work to help the human race. You find your caress. This happened to me when I was a graduate student. I was working on left-right brain differences. People helped me. Most of my dissertation was co-authored with my friends who were doing interesting work. We eventually, each chapter became a co-authored paper and we loved helping each other. The same thing is true today. The people I have cited, I've told you about Jeff McQuillan. I've told you about Nushan Ashtari. Uh, I've, I've worked with uh, uh, people who were my students years ago. We're still doing work together, uh, Fei Shin, other people. And when one person gets an idea and make progress, we're all happy because it's the enterprise that counts. We're all thrilled that we're making progress. And this is work that we feel we were born to do that feel natural. Uh, a famous writer, uh, Gloria Steinem, made this great quote. She said, when I'm writing, I don't feel I should be doing something else. When I'm working in my field that's right for me, I don't feel I should be doing something else. You will find that and you will find other people who will help you with it. Isn't that beautiful? And when one of you makes a mistake, and one of you may, writes an article, you're all very pleased because the work has done well. There's no such thing as competition when you get the right colleagues. I think that's beautiful. So I hope you find teammates, caress members. Okay, interesting. Thank you very much. So here's another question. Uh, a person is asking about what's the current trend in applied linguistics nowadays? Okay, the current trend? Here's my, blunt, my blunt, crude answer. I don't care. <laughs> you say in French, je m'en fous. I don't je really care. Je m'en fous. Okay. I care what burns inside of me. And that's what I'm suggesting you do. The trends will come and go. Sometimes the trends, see, I think the trends should be motivated based on what helps people. All too often, the trend is on what makes rich people richer. For example, in the United States right now, the trend is phonics. 
uh, sound spelling uh, connections. This is what we should do. This is important. I think it's so the phonics companies can make more money, frankly. So they're pushing everything. I like to think myself, what I think helps people, what I have seen, and people I work with, uh, Benico Mason's another one. If she says some things help, help her and her students, I really, really listen. Uh, exactly. So your caress members and you are the ones who decide. Don't worry about trends. They'll change. So, so maybe uh, people ask this, uh, this question because they think sometimes, especially for uh, university students, master students or PhD students, they want, they want to uh, write a, a paper about interesting topic related to, let's say, a trend, for example, nowadays facing this crisis, COVID-19. So it's better to, I think that I'm, most papers now are on uh, or about, uh, let's say, COVID-19, for example, distance education, distance learning, etc. Don't you think that, for example... That's uh, fine. If it agrees with your path, fine. But people have asked me, I've been asked many times to write a paper, be on a group, what about distance learning because of COVID? What do you think? Blah, blah, blah. I wrote one short paper about it. I gave my opinion, but I'm no expert. I'm more interested in pushing the theory in methodology, I think will help the theory, okay? Uh, you can't go with trends. There are other people who can work on it. Uh, I, I, it would be foolish for me to work on the biochemistry of COVID-19. And I'm also not an expert on distance learning. I have some ideas, but not big ones. I, I'm, I'm a little worried about distance learning, as a matter of fact, because of the emphasis on distance learning uh, you can put more and more students into a classroom. Uh, you can have not, not just 10, but you can have 2,000. Is this what we're aiming for? I don't know. So there are dangers as well. Interesting. Uh, so what do you think, uh, Professor, about uh, professional journals, uh, which, uh, let's say, uh, uh, charge uh, uh, some money, amount of money for not only... Uh, people who want to download the papers, I mean, uh, but for writers themselves. Yeah, that is inexcusable. They're much too expensive. I have stopped subscribing to most professional journals. Most of what I read is available for free. And because of that true, if enough of us do that, the field will change. Only the free open access articles will count if we ignore the expensive ones. We're going to change it ourselves. I would try to publish open access if at all possible. Then the world will change. We, the researchers, will change it. Especially with, with, with uh, for for university students, there it's expensive, expen very expensive for them. University students like or PhD students want to are, are are required to publish articles, but they cannot afford, let's say, fifty or one hundred thousand uh, let's say uh, dollars, one hundred dollars. Yeah. Impossible. When selecting a university, where to publish, where to study, I would so I would work with a professor who will support your interest, and a university that does not insist that you publish in trendy, popular journals that are very expensive. Uh, and I, I think uh, 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 those which charge, let's say, some amount of money for, for students, I think they accept uh, every we can paper because maybe it's a question of money. So we here yeah. we can talk about the quality of the paper. It's not right. like working for free, yeah. Yeah, this is called a vanity press where you pay a fee and you can get published. Uh, I think this is horrible. This is not the way the world works. And you don't, you're right, you don't find good papers in those journals, but I can't afford to read them anyway. So it doesn't matter. I found a few ways of illegally getting papers, okay? And that will, I will send you the link and you can share it with whoever you like, a, a way of, of downloading some papers that's I think illegal, but I don't care. I think the laws have to change. So, so what if, for example, if I had a, an interesting paper or topic and uh, didn't get pu published? So, so what should I do? Keep trying. Uh, keep trying. Keep so, uh, so, so how about, for example, if I, let's say, create my own website, not as an Abir Belmiki, as a, a person in general, 
and publish my work. That'd be tough. Without... It'll be hard to find. Find a journal if you can. Uh, my advice, look at what Jeff McQuillan has done, Backseat Linguist. Look at what I have done, the journals where I have published, and that might give you a clue as to where you can try. And those journals will get more popular. And if you publish there, and I see it, you, you find a journal, I see it, I can try publishing there. So we can help each other find the right journals. So this is interesting. This is for journals. If you want to publish articles, how about if you want to publish books? How about right now? Pub there's no way. I have not found a publisher that is inexpensive. They're all terribly expensive. I have not published a book in several years because they're simply too expensive. I can't afford to buy copies at author's discount. Wow. Okay, I can't afford. I, I have all my cousins. Okay. I like to get a copy for them and all that. Uh, oh. uh, my niece is a former school teacher. I like to get a copy for her, but I can't because they're too expensive. When a book sells for like $60 and you can yeah. get a 10% discount, you know, please, nobody makes that much money that I know of. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's bad. So as, as, as scholars, as researchers, how can you, uh, how can you contribute to avoid such... You find the journals that are open access. Again, I recommend look at what Jeff McQuillan has done. Look at what I have done. See where we have published. And that will give you an idea of where you can try publishing. And they'll be in different places, different countries all over the world. So I'm not the only person doing this. Uh, my colleague, Albert Pryor in India, has been doing this. He published a wonderful editorial in The Hindu, a famous... Uh, newspaper in India. So this, this is happening. It started in England in mathematics, uh, open access journals, because uh, people were complaining, well-known uh, researchers. So this, this is spreading and we can be part of it. I, th I think it's the common good. Here's a, here's a comparison. Right now in the United States with COVID, um, you can now get vaccinations for free, which is wonderful. It's being done because it's called the common good. The government is paying for it, and I support that. The same thing is with scientific information. Scientific information that helps people should be freely available. Yeah, and or, we're trying to do. Or, or at least universities should uh, help uh, students to pay for let's say, fees if they want to uh, publish in uh, a professional journal that they charge some money. I, I can't imagine that happening, but that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yes, there are actually journals uh, uh, for universities. Yeah, if there are, yeah, if they have their own journal, make it cheap, make it easy. I don't mind if they charge money, but how about making it cheap? How about five, yes. five American dollars a year? And it's online. Cost them nothing. Okay? Wow. Why yeah. not? Yeah, Five interesting. Of, I can afford that. Maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe they charge money just because for reviewers, pay reviewers, maybe they, they have to reviewers pay. Reviewers have never been paid anything ever. Those people who review, like I have, review it because it's a public service. I review all the time. And I feel it's an obligation because other people have reviewed my papers. And I appreciate what they have done. And they have done it for free. That is okay with me because we all do a little bit of it. We review, you know, an article every, you know, few weeks or so. No big deal. If it's short, then we yeah. can do it. And it's in our field. So I think that's fine. We're already contributing. We don't have to pay reviewers. Uh, those of us who are scholars should review and do it without complaint. Uh, so, Professor, so you encourage uh, publishing papers than books? Doesn't matter. Books are generally too expensive, I think. Uh, yeah. I would love to write more books, put things together, but nobody can afford them. I don't know any publishers who are less expensive. Oh, there's one publishing company. I don't know if they're still in business. Garn, G-A-R-N, a colleague of mine started it. It works in English language arts. The books are wonderful, and they used to sell. I don't know if they still do for like $5. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much for your uh, informative and interesting presentation. And thank you for answering all uh, our questions.
I appreciate that. And uh, I'm very happy and honored again to welcome you for the third time. And maybe we hope we'll see you here in Morocco uh, face to face. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, that would be great. Uh, that would be great. Uh, after COVID-19 crisis, maybe. Maybe, maybe. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much. I appreciate that. I really am very happy. And uh, thank okay. you very much for your kindness, support, and generosity. Uh, yes. Okay. And I say shukram to you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you speak Arabic. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Not yet. We will, yeah, we'll teach you some Arabic. We'll work on thank that. You for, okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.